Welcome back to the Compass Church, everybody. A huge welcome to all of you joining online. Appreciate you. Everybody who's at the Wheaton Campus, Bolingbrook, South Naperville, Naperville. And I am so excited to say welcome to the people of the Three Rivers Campus of the Compass Church. It's official and we love being with all of you. We love diving into this new series with all of you. The series is called Shattered, and it's about finding hope from the book of Job. I've never done a whole series on the book of Job before, and admittedly, Job's a big book, and we're only going to have four weeks, but we're going to do an overview that will richly minister to all of us who are going through hardship. That's really what Job is all about. And today, I come to you sitting on a bench that long ago was utilized by somebody profoundly important. That's right, the first lady of my favorite president of the United States sat right here. Friends, in this chair sat Mary Todd Lincoln, the wife of President Abraham Lincoln. We are presently in Batavia, Illinois, at Bellevue Place. Back in Mary Todd Lincoln's day, this place was called an asylum for mentally distressed ladies. And yes, Mary Todd Lincoln was declared insane and committed to this institution, locked up. It was her prison, as she referred to it. You know, we could speculate for a long time as to the anguish she felt inside of that building. But the truth is, it was not until recently that we could really see and understand just how bad it was. As it turns out, recently, letters written by Mary from this very institution to her friend Myra Bradwell, they were recently discovered by Myra Bradwell's descendants in a trunk up in the attic covered with cobwebs and dust. And as the letters that Mary wrote here were read, our hearts just break. Mary described the anguish, the many losses she was suffering. And it was at the end of one of those letters that Mary wrote this sad conclusion. She wrote, it does not appear that God is good. It does not appear that God is good. She was doubting the goodness of God. Friends, it's not something new in the case of Mary, and it was going to happen again and again countless times. People struggle with the confidence in God's goodness when they look at the immense hardship in their lives. Just think of what Mary Todd Lincoln went through. At that stage, she had lost her husband. He had been murdered in front of her at Ford's Theater. She had lost three of her four sons. Her two sons, uh, Willie and Eddie, died in childhood. And, And then Tad died at the age of 18. I mean, these were young men. And all that was left was Robert. And Robert turned his back on his mom. At least that was her perspective. He's the one who had her committed to this place. Robert looked at his mom, who was still depressed, understandably, who was going to seances, trying to connect with her deceased husband and children, and she was spending wildly. She had a spending addiction, you know, trying to get some joy in her life. She spent money she didn't have, and Robert was sick of it, had her committed to this place. She was locked up, occasionally permitted to come out and sit in these chairs, but in prison, at least, that's what it felt like to her. And so her anguish, God, if you're good, if you're all-powerful and all-knowing and all-loving, how can this be? I have compassion for her, don't you? And yet, think about this. Abraham Lincoln endured immense hardship himself. I mean, he lost two of his sons. He had the weight of the nation on him as the nation was seeing hundreds of thousands die in the Civil War. And yet with Abraham Lincoln, the the effect was totally different. 
it's so interesting when Mary and Abe married, Mary was the spiritually mature one, member of a church, church goer. She had to drag Abraham to church. He was a skeptic of Christianity, at times a critic of Christianity. But as the suffering increased, Lincoln found his faith in God and God's goodness growing. It's really ironic. Mary's spiritual life was declining because of hardship. And her husband, Abraham Lincoln, he was growing closer and closer to the Lord. In fact, to a few of his confidants, Abraham Lincoln shared that he committed his life to Christ around the time of his Gettysburg address. The Lord had won him over and he was fully on board. Let me tell you what happened in Lincoln's life one day. These events are brought to us by a woman named Elizabeth Keckley. Elizabeth was Mary Todd Lincoln's personal assistant. And on this particular night back in 1863, right in the middle of the Civil War, she was measuring the dress of Mary, helping to uh, alter it for her. Just then, Abraham Lincoln, the president, came bounding in with anger and frustration and distress all over his face. His wife Mary asked, where are you coming from, honey? And he said, the War Department. She asked, any news? And he's like, yeah, lots of news and none of it's good. He said, it is dark, dark everywhere. Dark, dark everywhere. Can't you feel his distraught? In that moment, he plopped down on the couch and he grabbed his Bible and started reading. This Elizabeth, the assistant of Mary, was so taken in by Lincoln's commitment to read the scriptures in his darkest hour. In fact, she wanted to know what he was reading. And so she made an excuse to walk around behind the couch, looked over his shoulder and saw that he was reading in the book of Job. Friends, it's time for us to dive into that incredibly important book and be ministered to by God as he has in the lives of so many others over the centuries. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. The man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. So here we go. Some things you should know about Job. This book is old. It's very old. Many scholars believe it's the first book of the Bible to be recorded before Genesis was written down. When did Job live? Most scholars believe around the time of Abraham. The reason we think it's that old going back uh, to the days of Abraham is just because none of the stuff we would typically see during the nation of Israel is mentioned. There's no mention of Israel, the law, the temple, the covenants, the king, the prophets, the scripture. It's just not there. And so we're dealing with a very, very old book that takes place in the land of Uz. Scholars aren't exactly sure where this ancient city was. From the reference points that are brought in the book, they think that it's northwest Saudi Arabia. Can you imagine that? And so we're going to spend four weeks. You say, Jeff, how do you handle a book that's 42 chapters long in four weeks? Well, let me tell you what our plan is. We've uh, divided the four weeks with these titles. What, why, how, when, all right? What is going on? It is all in relation to suffering. The series is called Shattered. How do you find hope in the book of Job? Well, what is going on when we're suffering? This comes out of the epilogue, which is the first two chapters of the book. And then a real big section is why is this happening? The why question. This is found in what's called the dialogue. We're going to see a lot of dialogue in the book of Job. In fact, chapters 3 through 37 are all dialogue. And then how? How can I handle this? There's a, a theophany. A theophany is an appearance of God where the Lord speaks in chapters 38 through 41. And, and we're going to look at how to handle suffering. 
And then when will this end is week four. And that's from chapter 42, which is the epilogue. And so as we turn to this man named Job, you should know that in addition to being rich in character and godliness, he is rich in possessions. And I mean crazy rich. Job has seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys, and large numbers of servants. Friends, those numbers are so high. He's like uh, Elon Musk. He's like the multi-billionaire of the ancient world. And so it's a unique guy. I mean, he's a hero in the ancient landscape, a man who's wealthy like no one else, and a man who's got this deep faith and commitment to the Lord. Let's see what happens. Turning now to verse 8 of Job 1. I'll give you the context here. We have a glimpse into the heavenly throne room and a dialogue that's going on between God and Satan. And here's what the Lord says. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on the earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Why is God mentioning Job? Well, here's the context. Satan, his very name means accuser. Satan has just revealed to the Lord that he's been going to and fro across the, the earth. What is he looking for? People to accuse. And assume, we can assume that he's brought names to God and said, these people are filled with moral compromise. And Satan's gloating in the accusations. But God, wanting to do a little gloating himself, says, how about my man Job? Now there's one, you can't come up with anything against him. Look how Satan responds to this bringing up of Job. Verse nine, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, you have put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has. This hedge is a hedge of protection. He's like, I can't get to him. God, you're protecting him so thoroughly that he's got no, nothing bad in his life. Satan continues in verse 11, strike everything he has and he will surely curse to your face. The case that Satan is making is that Job is not nearly as much of a God lover as the Lord would like to think. Satan's like, Job doesn't love you, Lord. He loves what you've done for him. He, he loves the blessings that you've brought. You take away those blessings, he'll turn on you on a dime. And the Lord's like, you think so, huh? Verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power. I give you permission to go after him. Take away what he has. The Lord says, don't kill him or harm his person, but regarding that which is his, go after it. And sure enough, Satan does. Look at verse 14. Right then there was a, a servant that came to Job and said this, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They stole all of his oxen and all of his donkeys. Major parts of his wealth gone, just like that. The Sabaeans, these are a people group from modern day Yemen, and they stole them. And in this moment, Job has just lost a significant portion of his personal estate. While he hears this bad news, another servant shows up. And this one says in verse 16, the fire of God fell from heavens and burned up the sheep. Fire of God, this is a reference to lightning crashing down, starting a fire that consumed his sheep. He's like, you're kidding me. Right then another servant shows up. Verse 17, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them all. His camels are now stolen. They're all gone. Uh, friends, this is the last bit of his financial estate. 
is lost by this group called the Chaldeans who lived in like southern Iraq, which would be northeast of where Job was. Friends, Satan is on the move and has wiped out all that belongs to Job monetarily, but there's more. Then another servant shows up, verse 19. A mighty wind swept in from the desert and it struck the four corners of the house and it collapsed on your sons and daughters and they are dead. Friends, Job had 10 kids. They were all at this brother's house gathering together when a tornado crushed the home and killed all 10 of them. Can you imagine this day? He has lost the people and the possessions that he had previously treasured and enjoyed. Look at Job's response. Verse 20, at this, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head. Friends, these are ancient signs of how people grieved when they were sick to their stomach. Because of the overwhelming pain in their lives, they would shave their head, tear their clothes. Job is deep in mourning. But mourning is not all that's going on. Look what he says next in verse 21. Job says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked will I depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Wow. Job is grieving immensely, and yet, miraculously, he is capable of submitting to the confusing, the confounding will of God. And he says, the Lord's given to me much. And for whatever reason, the Lord has taken away. I still say, I praise the Lord. Verse 22, in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. That's what so many of us do. You know, when things go bad, we shake our fist at the Lord and say, you've wronged me. Job's like, no, no, no. I don't know how to explain this. I don't know what's going on. Remember all that drama in the heavenly courtroom between Satan and God. Job is oblivious to all of that. We see it, but he doesn't. All he says is, I don't know what's going on, but I know this. My God is to be praised. He is not guilty of wrongdoing. Well, Satan goes back to the throne room in chapter 2 and says, all right, so your guy Job is doing pretty well. I tell you, let me make him sick. If he feels physical pain, he'll curse you. God says, okay. And so we see in verse 7 of chapter 2, Satan afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Job was just miserable. He actually took like pottery shards and was scraping these sores, though unhealthy. You know, he was seeking relief. The man is utterly miserable in every way imaginable. And His wife, in fact, look at verse 29. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die, Job. It's so interesting. It reminds me of Abraham Lincoln and his wife, Mary Todd. You know, as Lincoln was maintaining his confidence in God's goodness, Mary, the wife, was losing it. And here, uh, Job's wife is saying, I say, curse God. She's going to blame God. She's accusing God of wrongdoing. Job will not. Friends, I want to I go back to verse 22 just for a moment. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. If Job is right that God is not responsible for all this evil that's come into his life, who is? What is? How do we explain the presence of pain and suffering? This is one of the classic, most important questions that human beings can ask. And I contend that this reading we've done so far helps us. Can I list out four different causes of suffering that are true in our lives? We may not know all that's going on behind the scenes, but we can know through Scripture that these are causes. They are four. The first is 
fallen angels, then fallen planet, and then fallen people, and also fallen nature. Can I, can I go through them with you quickly? Fallen angels. We see that Satan, this angel who was once good but has turned in rebellion to God, he can cause hardship. God gave him permission. He went off and he brought these hardships, every one of them. He brought them into Job's life. And friends, the same is true with us. There is an angelic rebellion active still today. And we don't fully understand how Satan and his demons can bring hardship into our lives, but he can, and he does. Sometimes the hardship has demonic origin. Many times it does not. But one thing we learn from Job is that the enemy is real and active. When I say fallen planet, what do I mean there? The Bible teaches that planet Earth is cursed. Way back when humanity first rebelled with Adam and Eve, you can read about it in Genesis, the planet went wrong, broken. God said, all right, you want to do life without me? I'm going to take my sustaining hands away and you will see there will be brokenness all over in the world because of your decision to rebel from me. The brokenness of our human bodies is a result of the curse. Natural disasters result of the curse. In fact, when we talk about the fallen planet, we already read about lightning. Lightning that causes fires re resulting in death of many animals. This is, this is a natural disaster that we can say, yeah, it's part of the fact that this planet is violent and cursed. Now, it's a combination. It's Satan utilizing natural disaster in this case. Tornado, we already saw that. There'd be another example of a, the violence of this planet as a result of the curse, but also Satan using it. The sores on Job, that's a, an illness or a sickness, a disease. That also a result of the fallen planet. Friends, uh, even SIDS, I got a, I got a friend uh, who's a next door neighbor of our old residence and he lost his one year old son, actually a little less than one, to SIDS. Came in while he was napping and found him dead. I officiated his funeral and had to help carry this tiny little casket. I mean, you just wanna puke. You're like, why Lord, why? Friends, the, the, the horrific Suffering that comes with the curse points back to this rebellion. In fact, it's all fallen. It's all about the consequences of the rebellion that have, has occurred on planet Earth. But bodies of adults and children are racked with sickness at times because of the fallen planet. Next, fallen people. Uh, we see this, evil people causing abuse and harm to others. Where do we see this in the text? The Sabaeans and the Chaldeans. These two people groups stole. Now, was Satan behind it? Yes. So this one falls into the category of fallen angels and fallen people. But God allows the evil people at times to cause great harm. I think of this terrible tragedy in Texas in Uvalde at the Robb Elementary School where this evil person killed 19 little kids, two teachers. We just want to scream, what's going on, God? In fact, so many are questioning God's goodness in this moment. There's been kind of a prayer shaming going on where as folks say uh, you know my prayers are going out they're like stop your prayers in some cases some of that's because they're angry at God and don't even want God mentioned in this moment friends uh, how do you explain that evil people God now we can we'll get into why did he allow it but we need to understand that when people are in rebellion against God, one of the things they do is cause others harm, whether it be physical violence, stealing what is theirs, robbing them of opportunity, hurting their heart with words. The evil and the pain caused by evil people has always been real, and boy, is it still today. 
One more, though, and that is the fallen nature. That is, we each have a bent towards rebellion. It's called the fallen nature, biblically. And when we succumb to our fallen nature and choose to do evil things, we can receive the consequences of that. Why is this happening? Because I made this choice. I got a buddy whose father uh, died young, relatively, of cancer, lung cancer, and he smoked three packs a day. My buddy's like, no mystery why my dad died. You know, he played a role in bringing it on himself by choosing that habit. And uh, friends, sometimes we can just point to our fallen nature. So there, there, there it is. Fallen angels, fallen planet, the, the curse. Fallen people, evil people causing abuse. And fallen nature, us making hurtful decisions and bringing it on ourselves. What is the common theme? Just want to point it out. The common theme is that it's all evil. It's all rebellion. We live and operate in, on a planet in rebellion against God. And for these reasons, we suffer. Now, the, the big thing is, why didn't God Stop it. That, that's a fair question. Does, God is not excused of, you know, oh, oh, I see, so God's good. No, God's allowing this, and so we need to lean in. In fact, I want to bring out two points. The first out of uh, verse 10. Can we go back to it? Satan replied, you have put a hedge around him and his household. This is the good news, that, that God has put a hedge of protection now, you may always, be, I used to be bothered by this. I'm like, you know what, God, give me more protection than some little bushes. You should know in the ancient world, the hedge, they were massive thorn bushes that were dense, tall, and thick. And if there were animals on one side, the hedge was plenty sufficient to keep the predators at bay. And so God protects us from much suffering. That's just a principle. Uh, I'm going to use this hedge clippers as a reminder that God maintains a hedge of protection. Uh, this is kind of a bad reminder of a little friction between my wife and I because when I trim the hedge, she gets so mad at me. She wants me to do this little light trim, you know, just the edge of it. I'm like, man, uh, if I'm going to do it, let's make my time worth its while. So I hack her down pretty low, and Jen comes out and sees the, they'll grow back, you know. It's kind of when I cut my kid's hair, I shave Jake's hair down to that. I'm like, it'll grow back. I don't want to waste my time. Jen goes ballistic. Yeah, well, the hedge of protection, God uh, you know, hedge, hedge, scissor, hedge, uh, what do you call this? Trimmer is, is what's used to maintain healthy hedge. God maintains a healthy hedge of protection. Oh, how much God protects us from harm and evil that we never know. For every school that has a shooting, might it be that there are more where God has prevented the shooting from occurring? God protects, what the Satan says here, brings that activity of God into play. But you say, but yeah, but he let him in. You're right. Now let me remind us of verse 12. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power. God, if you will, makes a hole in the hedge. Uh, I have another tool here. This is what's called the lopper. And you would use this if you wanted to cut the thick branches of the hedge down low and create a big old gap where evil can get through. And so here's the tension that we have. We see two activities of God in this passage. One, maintaining a hedge to protect us from evil out of deep love, but not protecting us from all, allowing some to come our way. And this is the part that drives us crazy. This is the part that makes us scream, why? We understand the protection, Lord. We see your love clearly in your protection, but we don't see your love in allowing some of it to get our way. Friends, I hate to do this to you, but we're going to talk about the why next week. It's, why is this happening to me? And we're going to wrestle with uh, explanation for it. But I will simply tell you this, believe it or not, the love of God for us is behind both of these activities of him in our lives regarding hardship. 
Let me, let me close by telling you about an illustration of a woman who experienced both the hedge trimmer, God's protection, and the, the hedge lopper, uh, God allowing hardship to come her way. When I talk about God protecting her, it's remarkable. There were twice in her life where everybody else died, but she lived on to be an old woman. Her name was Anna Spafford. Feel a connection to Anna? Anna's Norwegian, I'm Norwegian. Anna was a Norwegian immigrant to Chicago where my ancestors immigrated from Norway to Chicago. And uh, Anna, boy, she had a hard life. This is where my story differs from hers. Anna, when she was just four years old, long time ago, back in 1846, there was a, a cholera epidemic that swept through Chicagoland. And when she was four years old, her family got this disease and her mom and dad died. Her baby brother died. Anna was the only one, little four-year-old girl who survived. You say, yeah, great, you know, for her. God protected her. Yes, he did. But he let her family die. Yes, he did. Anna grew up still to love the Lord like Job, and she married a lawyer in Chicago by the name of Horatio, and uh, they had four precious daughters, and they were living the dream. In fact, Horatio had said, let's, let's go to France on vacation, and then wouldn't you know, business matters prevented Horatio, the husband, from leaving at the same time, and so Anna and her four daughters got on a boat. The name of the boat was the SS Ville de Havre. And there were 313 passengers sailing from New York City to France. And that boat took off. And it was going to be a few weeks later that, that Horatio, the husband, was going to get on a boat and join his family. But Anna and her four precious daughters were sailing across the Atlantic Ocean when her boat crashed into another boat. In the fog, there was a collision of boats and her boat was horrifically damaged and within 12 minutes sunk beneath the surface. Amazingly, God intervened again and saved Anna. It's really a bit mysterious because she was knocked out unconscious and yet somebody found her unconscious body, dragged her to a boat of safety. Three-fourths of the passengers drowned. Only 81 of the 313 survived. Anna was one of them that survived. This is the hedge of protection on Anna. All four of her daughters drowned. As Anna was in that boat of safety that had been rescued, she wept. She grieved hysterically. There's the recounting of a man who saw her and came, sat next to her, tried to comfort her, but she was just sobbing beyond what's able to be described. And then after sobbing for a while, this man heard her utter these words. She said, the Lord has given me my four precious daughters. Now he has taken them away. He will help me to understand and accept his will with a resolution that reminds me of Job. What, what about her, her husband? She, she sent a message to Horatio and he was distraught beyond words, immediately jumped on the first boat. And as he was sailing across the Atlantic, grieving the loss of his four daughters. Like his wife, he found strength by God to trust in God's goodness, even though God had allowed this horrific accident to take his four kids. In fact, as Horatio came across uh, at the very spot where his daughters drowned, he penned what is now one of the most famous hymns of Christian hymnody. It is, it is well with my soul. Do you remember the words we, uh, we sing sometimes? When peace like a river attendeth my way, and when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou, God, has taught me to say, it is well, 
it is well with my soul. These sufferers felt the sharp edge of pain in this world and yet by God's grace maintained their confidence that God is good and loves them. May we do the same. God, life is such a mixed bag. We see your goodness and your love and we rejoice in all that is beautiful and shouts of how wonderful you are. And yet, God, we wrestle with the fact that this planet is so messed up and that life is filled for all of us with great pain. God, we're in a journey here where we're trying to make sense of what's going on. This glimpse behind the curtain, we thank you for it. We've gained some clarity. Admittedly, the journey's continuing next week. But Lord, we've gained some clarity in understanding why things are so messed up. We thank you much for that glimpse. Help all of my friends who are dealing with immense pain today and help them know that you are good and let them say it is well with my soul. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.